Okay, folks, this is Michael with the Reason RX podcast. Welcome, all things education. Today, in our first discussion with Scott Harris, the teacher, it'll just be me. Melanie is busy being a homeschool mom and piano teacher extraordinaire today. So, unfortunately, she can't join us. Um, she's got all the homeschool things going on and limousining her kids around, her three kids, and doing piano theory stuff, and so really busy today. But uh, she says hi, I'm sure. And she'll be joining us for more in the future. So um, just me today, again, Michael, private tutor, math, some physics, chemistry, thinking skills, can do that for students and if teachers and tutors want training I can help with that companies want to up their thinking skills I can help with that but uh, on the podcast today we're going to talk to Scott Harris the teacher um, don't need much introduction because people know teaching and learning what this is about and remember we need to think what we can learn from this in terms of principles it's not just like and I mean like not a principle of a school, P-A-L, but principles of like P-L-E-S, like principles of thinking. He can be talking about teaching and principles of good teaching sometime, but remember, you can apply that to like kind of teaching yourself. You can think about learning as self-teaching. So all this learning and teaching stuff is all wrapped up together. And as we all know, it's not just something kids do. Um, Adults have to learn too. You got to learn about children, how to raise children, how to get them into a school, um, how to help them be healthy and exercise and thrive and um, know what the school is going to do to help them out and what you got to do on your own. Learn things at work, um, all kinds of things for your own health and well being. You got to know. Uh, you know, it's being a thinker and learner is essential to being a human being all through life. So we'll be getting into that today, you know, naturally, even if not explicitly, at least implicitly. So, um, so I'll let Scott go ahead and introduce himself and then we'll get into some good discussion here. Scott, can you tell us about yourself, please? really quickly I gotta say sorry folks I just realized by looking at my speaker recording thing that Scott I didn't have you I think it'll pick up but in the first 12 minutes I didn't have the sound going in through Skype to speaker with this sound flower thing okay um, so now you're picking up better sorry I didn't notice that earlier but so the first 12 minutes or so it might be kind of on your side maybe a little low volume or something We'll see, but it should be better now anyway. Okay. Okay, but anyway, I'm new to this. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, you know, we all like make mistakes. So that's a, that's a good, how about that? That's a good like educational learning lesson there, you know? <laughs> Talk about and and that's, that certainly happens in the classroom. You think you have this great idea and it just dies. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, well, I won't try that next period. <laughs> Been there, done that. Yeah. Or heck, no matter who. Admiral of the Navy, President of the U.S., CEO of a big corporation. Even Steve Jobs made mistakes. But, uh, so, yeah, um, so this is some stuff, some as I say, some people can do to really help. Um, parents can do to help their kids out, help them think better, drive, drive them to ask more questions, do all these organic things. And and one thing people want to do, um, you know, the thing you were just saying before I started talking about the organic thing was interesting. Before I noticed that <laughs> gaff I had done. Um, the way I like to put the same thing is um, one of the most important things I do in tutoring is to go off on tangents or get off task, as some people would call it, 
you know, we're not doing the problem, so you're off task. No, we are learning how to develop our thinking from this math problem to other things in life. You know, drawing, if we're doing something in math and there's students makes a certain mistake or they do something and then we say, okay, how does that apply to all human life? Some people would say, that's off task. We're not doing the math, stay on task. No, we are on task at a more fundamental level because we're doing what education is about. Absolutely. And, you know, too many teachers, especially the new ones, are worried about the tyranny of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And the curriculum is a guide. If, you the know, guide what you on the just... side, some people yeah. have to say of teachers, the oh, curriculum we'll get... is the guide on the side. We could do 20 minutes on that phrase alone. But, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, what you said uh, is like a surfer catching a wave. Why would you not ride that wave when hmm, the yeah. kids are engaged and interested and in saying, yes. no, this isn't the correct wave to be riding? <laughs> now, obviously, there's the kids that always try to get you off track, but that's not what we're talking about. But then if you're really, when you get more proficient at teaching and more wise with more practice, you can take someone who's trying to get you off task. And if you're really mindful, then you can make it a learning experience and really help them learn how to think and be rational and logical. Even though the kid didn't expect it, it'd be like over his head. I didn't even see that coming. <laughs> right. Some nice Socratic questioning about, um, you know, does that it does that have to do with what we're talking about? I mean, you could say it, you know, in a way that would get him back on track or perhaps what they have brought up is intriguing. Um, but too often it's just this reflexive. That's not what we're talking about. Um, yeah. Ask the kid, why did that idea come to your mind when we were talking about whatever it is we were talking about? And now maybe there's a deeper connection. Yeah, but unfortunately, as you say, it's like oh my God, I have this lesson I have to teach and the test is coming up and I have to cover this material so everyone knows. And then like, if they don't, I got to like do tutoring and stuff and the test is going to come yeah. up and if they fail, then I look bad and you know, it's just this panic. But what you and I are talking about, getting them engaged at this higher conceptual level is what drags that other stuff along. I told my students, I never, I don't care about the little standardized nuggets we're supposed to cover because what we're doing is going to be so far above that that our coattails are easily going to drag through that standardized test. Yeah. Our scores are going to be fine. And so people know that we're not just like in la la land making stuff up, doing wishful thinking. Like one student I tutored, I talked about this in episode one. Um, so people can go back and listen to our intro episode that Melanie and I made if you want, but one student I tutored for years, um, worked with him on math and science and SAT, ACT, but uh, weird noise. Sounded like a keyboard was going, huh? Okay, but anyway, so I worked with this, this guy. He got two degrees at Texas A&M, not a easy school, genetics and biochemistry, I think, not little pedant degrees. Um, and in immunology, one of the hardest courses you take, you know, the immune system, very complex, complicated arguments, disagreements about what's going on and all these like biochemical reactions and stuff. Um, but in immunology, he got uh, 102. And that's the highest grade he said his teacher had given in 20 years at teaching at A&M. And I didn't tutor him in immunology. Nothing. Zero. The reason he got the 102 is because of these off-topic conversations and this tan off tangents, this tangent stuff we did about what's the nature of science? What is science and logic really? Like, how do you learn and what is education? How can you memorize things? Because of that, he was able to go independently on his own and get a 102 in immunology. So this this off-task stuff is not woo-woo, oh, we wish, and we're so cool. It's proven fact. 
Well, uh, two examples. One, I had a student tell me he had taken me for economic psychology and philosophy across three different semesters. And he said, you know, you teach the same course. <laughs> and, and he meant that as a compliment because mm -hmm. of what you were talking about there, about making connections, thinking interdisciplinarily, um, using logic or reason, and then you have the tools to explore. Uh, another example, we had a professor come to our school from West Point, and hmm. he was teaching French. And uh, his, his argument is you don't have them for 50 minutes. You have them for 30. And they're going to get distracted in between. But if you can get them really engaged, those 30 minutes they are engaged will be much more than. And so he did it by having these off-topic conversations and talking hmm. about their lives a little bit at the beginning of class. All of a sudden, over the next, say, seven years, they had an increasing number of French majors <laughs> at West Point. And, it, and their scores, of course, went through the roof. And now all these kids were majoring in French. And that's that human connection and understanding reason as it applies to subjects. Yeah. And I've had parents tell me, thanks for the examples. Good. And I've had parents tell me, so let's say I'm just tutoring their kids and for some context first, I'm tutoring a kid in math only, but because of the math we're doing and how we're talking about reasoning and logic and these so-called off-topic conversations we have, the parents report their grades improve in all their subjects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it helps. Um, that's the nature of thinking. but. Uh, so what are some particular things that parents could do to help their kids better in like history and economics and all that? Well, one thing you just mentioned is talking, right? You said that you talk to this kid in off topic conversations, um, parents can do that. Uh, we, we're all familiar with kids in that, uh, you know, two to five year old range when they have endless questions and it drives you nuts. Why is the sky blue? Why isn't it? You know, uh, and, and we breed that out of them through middle school and mm -hmm. teach them to sit in rows and, you know, do your multiple choice. But that that's what we want to capture. So the first thing then is just having conversations. Um, when my son and I drive and take him to dance practice or wherever, we're always having interesting conversations, uh, usually initiated by him. <laughs> Good, yeah. More motivation there. Because I remember when I'm younger, yeah, and parents want to talk about something and it seems contrived, and it's just like, can you just leave me alone? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and I, al I, I also try to let those emerge naturally. An example, when uh, the election, Hillary versus Trump, I didn't talk to either of my sons about it. I didn't tell them to form an opinion. They told me what they thought, and I could tell a lot of uh, what they thought was what they were hearing around school. But it was probably six months or a year in to Trump's first term that they started asking interesting questions. And then I went with it and we explored the issue. Uh, I'm not a fan of indoctrinating kids. And I, and I get that teaching your kid values and, and politics are values in part. Um, but I want them to do some thinking of it on their own instead of me being at the dinner table every night saying this candidate is evil and this candidate is, you know, the one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think teaching them tools of survival is going to help them a lot more in the long run, help them be more independent and happy, and then reach the correct conclusions. And then it's good, you know, if like they're close to you and you teach them to think really well, then surprise, surprise, maybe um, a parent could learn something from a student, I mean, from their kid, you know, say, oh, whoa, I was wrong. The kid's actually right. Whoa, cool. Well, and that's back to principle thinking, that if you think it's wrong when uh, politician number one violates the Constitution, do you also think it is when politician number two violates the Constitution? Yeah. And of course, too many people are really flexible with that. When their yeah. person is in office, yeah. they kind of look the other way. Yeah. All right, let me see. 
Okay, well, I think one of my cats wants to be let out door, so <laughs> one second. Take a break for a second, folks. Sure. Kitty is free. <laughs> so, um, and one thing people might want to look up, um, parents, you know, in particular, um, or teachers, um, people who work with the young, a book I listened to recently was really good, um, called Voice Lessons for Parents, and I'll put it in the show notes, put a link to it, um, by... Wendy Mogul, Dr. Wendy Mogul. Um, you know, it's, of course, it's a nice title. I really like that. Um, but, of course, it's about how to talk to kids. As you can tell, voice lessons, how to talk to them. Not just, you know, it sounds like singing, but, of course, it's about tone of voice, what to say, what not to say, um, theory of child development, things like that some sounds uh, sounds interesting yeah boys kind of the way like boys mostly are and girls mostly are and similarities and differences and um how in general like fathers are and mothers are and she you know she talks about how at the beginning she's considering mother as a general concept and father as a general concept for not necessarily male and female but for certain roles um, has some really interesting um, ideas in there. Something I'll probably I think I should listen to again. Actually, I listen to it on Audible, which I really like. Uh huh. But uh, so yeah, like it'd be good to let the students, you know, people, parents let their kids ask stuff naturally and develop from there, um, and then how can they be ready to answer some of those questions and when should they punt and when should they take on a subject? Um, schools do a pretty decent job of gauging age appropriate things as far as how history is covered or what kind of literature uh, will be read at what age appropriate level. But again, the kid is gonna signal a lot of that. Um, my youngest son did not like history initially because it was wars and it was people dying. <laughs> yeah. And even if I had the news on or whatever and he walked by the TV, he would cover his eyes. He's like, oh, you know, I don't like history. And of course, hearing that bro broke my heart. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, guess who's obsessed with history now? <laughs> Good. Once he studied Rome, that's all it took. Cool. And he's all in on history and battles and cool. um yeah. And that's one thing. Um, I think I was, was kind of thought of a few things to say in that regard, but um, it's, people might not have had a good enough history education or maybe they've forgotten it. So it's still good for people to review to get that historical mindset in place because, you know, so it's, it's good for parents to like dig into the stuff to help their children. You can listen to podcasts or listen to books on Audible, so you don't got to take the time to read. Um, have your child teach you and, you know, really be kind of critical about whether you actually understand so you know if they're able to explain it well. Um, that's some things that um, parents could do. But it's important because, you know, the historical mindset is important for all kinds of different things. We shouldn't think, oh, that's history. Who cares? But, you know, history tells us where we came from and why things are the way they are so it's important on its own but the historical mindset and methods are important to know like about our own development and like grasping that and thinking about what made us and where we want to go or where our kids came from where they are now and where we want to try to direct them be in the to be in the future you can't do that without historical methods or thinking about geography evolution the history of animals um like the history of the solar system all kinds of things involve this historical mindset and these historical methods of this cause effect through time even if it's not specifically 
ideas as it is in like human cultural history. And and the study of history helps exterminate the utopian mindset. When has that mm-hmm. idea ever worked in the past, right? Yeah. There's, n- there's nothing new under the sun. And if you think it's going to work this time, what's different about it this time than all the other times that it's failed? Yeah, there's got to be some cause. You got to look for similarities and differences. If things are the same, how can you expect a different right. effect? That causal reasoning, counterfactual reasoning. And politicians, of course, are forever promising that if you vote for me, I'll set you free. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, this will happen and that will happen and everything. And they always use the word solution. Mm-hmm. No economist, <laughs> no historian, no psychologist would use the word solution. It's about arranging better trade-offs. That there's always a cost of something. That if we do X, why is going to be a side effect and of course politicians specialize in covering the side effects and just look at this thing that you're interested in and uh yeah history can teach us to to cut through that yeah so that's a good good point you bring up about how it helps with modern politics and assessing candidates and knowing what a good society is what kind of societies have worked in the past where did we come from? What's possible? What new things can we think of? And unless there's some change in conditions or other aspects about the cause, you can't expect a different effect. That's something that needs to be, cause effect needs to be explicitly discussed and addressed more and looking at identifying causal relationships and grasping the nature of things. And that's a good point. Uh, When students first start learning to reason like this, they think, oh, well, you're anti-government. It's like, no, no, it's about what's the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. Government is a tool that's very good at certain things uh, that almost nothing else can do, but then it's also not good at a lot of things. But so many kids, right, or, or really humans, their first reflex, if something's wrong in society, it's there ought to be a law. <laughs> and I'm like, well, now, wait a minute. A law means you're willing to have somebody, uh, if they don't do it, you're going to send policemen with guns to lock them in a metal cage. I'm not willing to do that because you want to use a straw in your soda. Yeah. Right. That's not the way to solve the plastic problem, yeah, in my and, opinion. Yeah. And. And then right there, some people might think, oh, you don't have a law, you're anti-human, you're anti-society, you're going to destroy the world. No, it's just there's other ways to get the effect. And, and, and we don't discuss those. It's either the government should do it or we're all going to fall apart. Well, there's lots of ways these problems can be solved. Again, what's the best tool for the best job? And a good thing, I, I don't remember who the author was, but when there was uh, – issue in New York years ago where a gentleman was unfortunately arrested for selling cigarettes without a license on the street and the yes. local businesses complained. Um, he had been doing it for a while, but they complained and because of the laws, then the police have to arrest him. And I think he had a heart condition and so he died. And someone wrote an article about that. Made a, They made a very good point. They said, the guy said, if you're not willing to kill someone over a point, then you should not have a law because that will inevitably happen when there is a law. And and that was, we talked about that in my class. Um, in neighborhoods where people don't have a lot of money and are living hand to mouth, you can't afford a pack of cigarettes or certainly not a carton of cigarettes. Yeah. So they sell them in singles, which the manufacturers don't like you to do because you're going to mark it up and take a little bit of a profit. But that's serving a real social need that people have, mm-hmm. whether or not they should smoke is another issue of giving people what they need in smaller amounts. And should the government be able to do that? Of course, then that leads to discussions on taxation because the taxes you pay on tobacco are actually more than the product itself. And, and so now we're having discussions about sin taxes and how much leverage should uh, the government try to use to get us to be good. Yeah. 
So there's, and that's a good example, that little thing in New York, how instead of getting all bogged in down into concrete, we need to think about principled issues and put it in context of what we learned in history so we can better evaluate it and really understand. Because understanding is, you know, so like the Greeks, first of all, made a distinction between opinion and knowledge. Okay. And, you know, if you can have an opinion, it might not, it might be right, might, it might be right, might not be, but it's just what you like believe. But knowledge is specifically something that is true. So there's that. But then when we go further, we have understanding. And I like what I've heard. Um, philosopher talks about three characteristics of understanding. And this helped me get insight into what understanding is that I never had before. So I don't consider myself to understand something. And I don't say students understand something until, and I teach them this sometimes explicitly, this is what understanding is. Understanding is knowing the essence of something, reducing it to the evidence of the senses, and connecting the idea to other causally relevant things we know. So for example, friendship or friend. What is a friend, essentially? You know, it's a person who you share values with and spend time with you're acquainted with them, um, things like that. Um, and then you reduce it back to the evidence of the senses. So that can be, um, you know, how well you define friend can vary and you still know the essence. How much you reduce can vary some, but you need to know that it's a friend, they're a value. What are values? What is life? Have examples of friends. And then you need to connect it to things like um, your health, morality, um, honesty, justice. And notice people do that naturally as you're growing up because when you're younger, a friend is just someone you play with, right? <laughs> and, right. and then when we get older, it's like, whoa, um, I can play with that person, but then they start hitting me. That's not fun. Um, then you start to learn more about what a friend is because you're starting to connect it with more things you know. Um, and then with more experiences in life, then, you know, you're like maybe in junior high school and you have a friend and then you find out that they're backstabbing you. And then it's like, whoa, honesty and fair treatment matters. It's not just playing with someone. So we're starting to make these broader connections. So understanding is knowing the essence of something, reducing it to the evidence of the senses and connecting it to other things, you know. And, and Plato talked about this with his uh, famous description of the divided line, and that below that line, it's just sensory information, right? Opinions, images, false images. So this would be uh, politicians telling us what we want to hear. It would be Madison Avenue with uh, mm -hmm. marketing that makes everything look wonderful. It's not real. It's, it's a representation of uh, but as we start using reason and abstracting, as you talked about, now we get above that divided line and we start using the disciplines of knowledge and we start seeing the essences of those things. What makes a just law? What really is beauty? And I tell my kids, I want to spend as much of my life above the divided line as I can. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's and, nice. It's frustrating because the minute you, you try and pull a lot of people above it, they want to go back to talking about the weather or just I had lunch last Tuesday with my friend. And, and that's part of life. Yeah, yeah, but to yeah. me, the, the interesting and engaging parts, um, I, I read about this one guy who would get on elevators and he would just turn to the person next to him and ask them a really deep question. Hmm. Like, what's, what's your biggest failure? And they're like, what? I don't even know you. And he's like, I'm getting off at the next floor. Just tell me. And, <laughs> and, and people would just drop these deep, huh. you know, yeah. and, and he would do the same. And I thought, wow. He must have learned a lot. lot. That would be a lot more fun to go around in society instead of saying, hot mm -hmm. enough for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and you know, to be clear, people, Scott's not saying that 
talking about the weather is small talk and stupid and if you did it you're wasting time you know that's part of life it's something that's we build abstractions upon you talk about the weather you learn what a person likes but it's about going beyond that so it's about having conversations that are both concrete and abstract would you agree scott because i don't want to talk yes. for you i don't want to yes, like no yeah so it's like talking about some abstract principle of health but giving examples or like what we've been doing i don't i didn't say we know all this stuff on education and going off on tangents are good i gave examples you got the abstraction how we do it to some extent with specific questions thinking about what understanding is and helping them understand things and know what understanding is and these so-called tangents um getting them to see the bigger picture seeing um what they're saying how it relates to previous things in history so these tangents are things like that and then we talked about some you know what the tangents and so-called getting off task is like and then we gave examples of how it helps you know so it's both of them combined not all concrete or flooding abstractions with nothing to do with the world so one way I try and teach them that is, uh, I, and I have a picture of a table up on the PowerPoint. I say, what is a table? And they look at me and I'm like, let's, <laughs> let's define a table. What makes a table cool. a table, right? As Plato would say, what is the tableness, that the essence of what a table has to be? And so uh, we decide that it has to be flat. If it's sloped like their desks are, it's a desk, <laughs> it's not a table. Now, you, you can eat device. your lunch but from your desk, but it's still not a table. That's why it's a different word. And then we decide, well, somebody says it needs to have, uh, you know, four legs. Well, I have a table at home with three. I have one with two. Um, okay, so at least one or more legs, they say. Well, I've seen a table sticking out of a wall with no legs. I've seen a table hanging from steel cables. Uh, so we decide it's flat and that it's elevated. Uh, we talk about, well, we could say the floor is a table. We could eat on the floor and have a picnic lunch. We're using the floor as a table, but the floor is a different thing than the table. So we end up with a flat, elevated surface with supports. So that's the essence of what a table is. It can be many other things made of wood, made of metal, but it has to be those things. And then we talk about how a dictionary is a collection of bounded concepts that we can argue about, say, art, and how wide or narrow the definition should be, but it still has to have a definition. And then we proceed to define art, which they think is impossible. Well, table one thing, but art you can never define. Yeah, Sure you can. And that's a good, um, again, people might think, oh, well, it's just a table, who cares? But we got to look at things like that to get the basic methods down with something kind of more simple and accessible. But then this is something people could do and would be very beneficial because all human action involves thinking. The better your thinking is, the better you can act. But, you know, um, define and try to understand in the way I said, parenting, childhood, student, teacher, education, marketing, um, finance, um, engineering, um, making a pipeline. Um, having biodiversity, things like that. What is a pipeline? What is biodiversity? How do they relate to other things we know, right? And and by starting with something as simple as a table, it's accessible to everybody. They all have used tables. Um, we also do it with a pen. Right? When we talk about metaphysics, which is the branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of things, the nature of reality, what makes a pen a pen? What are the good components or the components of a good pen? And so by getting them to kind of pick apart what these things have to be, it's training their mind so that when we get to more complex things like art or justice or beauty mm -hmm. or what makes a good politician, they have had the tools and some practice on everyday type things. Yeah. Just like same thing in math, you got to do build up from the basics and you got to do the easy stuff before you do the hard like that's one thing I do when I'm tutoring you know I worked with one student recently and 
they're doing logarithms and people probably won't remember that so it won't make much sense to them but you got these rules for these thing called logs and he had this problem where you got to do like a bunch of rules at one time and it's like no 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 okay look john that's not his real name it's a like, look john this is what we do you got to get the rules do simple examples assimilate that on your thinking get that memorized in in your brain and mind and then make some a little more difficult and then a little more so we did one simple rule a number of times another simple rule another number of times another simple rule another times now let's put two of them together okay so now you got rule a rule b rule c so now you do rule a oh and then do rule c well look on this one you do rule b and then rule c here you do rule c then rule a and we do a number of those and then naturally enough he's able to get it and then we can start doing harder stuff but yeah we have to build up from the simple like that and that kind of integration of learning one the other then putting them together and going back and forth is what helps build the neural networks that are allow them to remember it instead of studying these things in isolation yeah um, they've even done this memory studies with uh, let's have kids memorize impressionist paintings uh, and you would think that let's show you 10 paintings by Monet in a row and then we'll study Monet or Gauguin or whoever uh, it turns out by mixing them up the kids are able to determine the styles faster than if you just study mm -hmm. one set yeah I've heard that in a number of different areas um, so it's good to get um, let me see if you agree first do the basics um, then you got to start mixing them up and then if I was in a I got limited time with tutoring but if I was going to do more then I might have them do a long division and then um, have them do factoring uh, quadratic and then oh hey now let's do two rules of logs and then all of a sudden let's graph this parabola and okay now we're going to do two rules of logs and that makes you jump back and forth it really makes you assimilate things a lot better a absolutely right um, there is a lot of research uh, by cognitive psychologists and that is the single one of the single best things you can do and even with your studying, don't study all of your English and then go to all of the math. Do the English worksheet, do some math assignments, now read the history, and, and they call that interleaving. So you're, you're mixing it up and it leads for greater cognitive gains. Plus it's teaching you to think interdisciplinarily. Yeah, and so that's some, again, remember if we stop to think, take the slow replay it. This is stuff that teachers can utilize with students, students can, do on their own parents can do with their students parents can do at work i mean people have to teach at work so this is not like this applies only to like so-called school um there's a lot of training that goes on at work and <laughs> wherever there's training there's thinking and what we're talking about is reason and logic and thinking no matter what the particular accidental location happens to be it's not just for a school it's for all human life and and one point about that you, you said teaching at work or uh, is called the curse of knowledge and that when you know something really well um it, it it's yeah. difficult to understand why other people don't get it it's so yeah. clear <laughs> and obvious and of course you know my students uh They've only been alive for 15 to 18 years, and you just have these presumptions about what people know. And so learning how to question about what they're not getting, mm -hmm. right, and how they see it and have them verbalize that uh, really helps that. Yeah, and then that idea I talked about with understanding, if people think about really breaking something down to see where it comes from, from the evidence of the senses, that'll help them see if they're explaining something to someone, why the person's not getting it. And a good way to do that is think, what did you have to do through life from when you were born to get to that um, concept or idea now? So like with friend, 
you start out, you got to learn just to see things. And, um, you know, you're learning, like you're being fed and all this. And eventually you learn, like you learn some different stuff. And some of your first words, you know, you learn food and like kind of sorta and share and stuff and stuff around you. And then you learn like mom and dad. Um, and there's, and you learn, you know, like some kids think yesterday, they don't get the concept at first and they think it means any time before today instead of just specifically yeah. the day before or tomorrow yeah. they think is any time in the future instead of specifically the day after today <laughs> or with father or mother they don't get that at first and they think father means any man right and if people understand how concept formation works then they won't they'll understand better what a child's doing. The child's learning to organize things in group and it's fine. And, you know, then the child's starting to learn about other people and you start to play with the parents and they're starting to get this implicit idea of play. And then they, they start to, you know, so this is what you'd be doing. And you learn about different people, um, relatives, friends, other people, some are boring, some you hate, some are, injurious to you some you like to play with and oh then you start to get this concept of friend and then we do some of the other stuff i talked about and so there's like the hierarchy the development of how you get the idea of friend and people can apply that to different concepts at work um or with parents and teachers can do it and students on their own to some extent that they can to they can apply it to things they're learning then they'll understand what trouble they might be having or what someone trouble someone else might be having. Right. Right. So very, very important, um, issues there. And so I think that's one thing that among others, you know, one thing yeah, that differentiates what we're doing and learning to do than what some other philosophies of education do say it again i think um the reduction and looking at understanding like that and using logic is something that you know i'm not saying i'm a know-it-all i'm not i've learned a lot i do know what i do and understand but i'm sure this could be developed a lot more than i've done so far but this is something that differentiates us and I think how things should be done because look how successful it is versus some other philosophies of education. Sure. Um, and when kids discover how to use those tools, they get engaged, they get excited. You hear them applying this kind of thinking to their daily life and, and really trying to define, as you said, uh, what is a friend, right? And um, the Stoics argued that uh, a friend does not necessarily have to be someone who's alive. And so I point to my bookshelf and I said, I got a lot of <laughs> friends up here. And they laugh and I said, look, I've spent a lot more time with Aristotle than I have most of my human friends. Hmm. And, and you know, the book is the product of someone's mind and, yeah. and you interact with that and you write in the margin. And I've, I've spent a lot of time with some of those people. Cool, yeah, interesting. But yeah, and so, other things that occurred to me, like um, the importance of some of this, like defining terms, it's another important issue that differentiates us. And it's good you've developed it. But um, if people stop to think about, like, what is health or what is cancer, even doctors, I've been studying biology more for the past few years, really digging, digging into it, um, studying about epigenetics and the nature of cancer. And yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people think that even medical doctors and some scientists think that cancer is genetic, but it is not. Because, you know, again, they're looking at it's a matter of definition, knowing what science really is, instead of being lost in this platonic view of science and following authority and convention. You know, you got to be independent in your thinking and know real science and logic. Define your terms, know science and logic, understand things, then you can really know what cancer is. 
and you got to be more like the Wright brothers, like people who are going to be successful with cancer and helping that, preventing it or fighting it, are going to be like the Wright brothers. Because people think, oh, the Wright brothers are the first ones to fly. No, other people were already flying. The Wright brothers were the first ones to make a plane go far and to make it turn. So the thing Sustained is... Sustained flight. Yeah, there was some world authority <laughs> in aviation... And he had this coefficient of how the air and the wing interacted. Everyone was doing, following that, following authority, not thinking for themselves, and they were failing. The Wright brothers, they were successful because they were the ones to think, I want reality, not authority. I'm going to figure this out for myself. So they developed, you know, wind tunnels had already been invented, but they developed their own. They made it from like, you know, bicycle parts and all this as they usually did, geniuses. And they did different tests on different airplane wings, took different measurements, um, figured out what really mattered to measure to get a wing that worked, and then they went out and did it. And that's the kind of thing we need to make people healthy, to deal with cancer. And we talk about the Wright Brothers in economics because they had a competitor who was getting subsidized by Congress, hmm. and he had a boat with uh, some kind of uh, catapult mechanism that would <laughs> launch his model, and he kept crashing them into the Potomac. But because he had subsidies, he didn't have to really do the abstraction and figure out what is it that causes flight. And through the wind tunnel, the Wright Brothers were able to get the principles correct extrapolate that to a larger plane and then it worked yeah yeah there's a lot of and cases it, where having to do it yourself makes you be honest um you got kind of someone taking care of you or the subsidy and uh, i don't i can survive and i can do well in society i don't really have to necessarily be right and the right brothers are like bottom of the bucket broke you know bicycle yeah, repairman and, and so the takeaway phrase we get from that is subsidies inhibit innovation mm -hmm. and we see case after case that it is the struggle right the butterfly uh coming out right and that struggle pushes the water out of their wings and if you help them with that the the butterfly can't fly yeah like i've heard in africa um there's problems because you know people are good at heart and want to help others but we need to know history and think about the bigger picture because, you know, like some companies send shoes to Africa, then they're free. Then right. all the people who made shoes go out of business. Then these people who get shoes, you know, then they're not used to them. So they have foot problems. Um, they get feet deformities. They wear out their shoes and then there's no shoes left. No one's making them, you know, well, and, and t textiles tends to be one of the uh, comparative advantages that developing countries have. There was a rapper some years back that sent a million t-shirts to Africa or something. You're flooding the market with the one thing that they're good at. Hmm. Like that's not helping. Yeah, it's sad. So yeah, we, you know, we should think about how, what we can do to really help people in the bigger picture and not just throw something at them and well, and it, even something obvious like a water well, I remember reading about one village in which they drilled a well, and now the women didn't have to walk, uh, you know, a half hour each way to get water every day. The well was poisoned within a couple of weeks because mm. it turned out that was the one time they didn't have to watch the kids and the men had to watch the kids. That was valuable social time. So if you don't understand a culture mm, or... Wow how incentives shape human behavior, you just come in and, and try and put these band-aids on things. Yeah. So, you have so, unintended consequences. Yeah. And I know that's something for people to realize. So you're trying to do, you're good at heart. You're trying to do good things to help people out. But some stuff like that can like backfire. So we really got to be careful so we can really do good for other people. And then other things too, it's like um, then the women in the, village might not be getting enough exercise it's not just labor you know human beings need exercise we need movement we need sunshine so this could be like keeping them from getting out in the sun possibly i'm just saying hypothetically i don't know doing the counterfactual thing like you said looking at possibilities what ifs but they might not be getting enough sunshine 
therefore they might not be getting enough vitamin D, therefore they might have bone problems, and also they might have um, not be able to produce babies that are going to be as healthy? Well, certainly um, Americans, what is it, something like 40% of Americans have vitamin D deficiency. We, we spend a lot of time inside and computers uh, has, has made it easier to stay inside and be engaged. Yeah, so it might be more than 40%. I don't know if I've heard higher figures, but I don't recall right now. But yeah, so we gotta make sure we are aware of, again, like, you know, understand what it is to be a human, define things, dig into it, what is health, then you can see, whoa, I'm indoors, this is a mistake, I need to get outside so I can be healthier to better thrive and take care of myself and take care of those I love and help make society better. Yeah. It's kind of that unfortunate, unintended consequences thing that we're not going to avoid unless we really up our level of thinking and analyze things logically. So cool. So we'll let people digest that for right now. That's a lot. And I hope people realize how important some of that really is and take that to heart. Um, then we'll have to have future discussions about all this and more. We'll think about, stop and think about what we said and maybe have some follow-up discussion and go over some other questions. But uh, what are some of the main things we discussed today that people should take from this? Well, we talked about engaging with your kids and having those conversations. Uh, any parent knows that, especially if you have boys and you sit them down and say, now tell me about your day, that's a short conversation. <laughs> What'd you learn today? Nothing. Um, you know, how was your day? Fine. So getting a little more Socratic, um, what was the most interesting part about today? What was a frustration that you had today? What was the nicest thing somebody said to you? What's the nicest thing you said to somebody else? And so conversations like that. And of course, when you're not trying to converse with them is usually when they open up. It could be giving them a bath, tucking them into bed. All of a sudden they wanna talk. And again, we're back to the tyranny of the timeline. No bedtime, have the conversation. You know, seven minutes on the bedtime isn't really gonna matter. Yeah. So. Yeah, try to be more flexible in thinking and activities through the day and through life. And then conceptual reasoning and abstraction. What makes a table a table? What makes a friend a friend? Um, we all claim to have lots of friends, but what's the difference between a friend and an acquaintance? And uh, when I used to coach, we called them rope holders. If you were hanging off the edge of a cliff, which friend would you trust to be holding the rope? Yeah. And, and I don't mean your strongest friend, that's obvious, but you know, we all have those friends that wouldn't bother to show up on time and so on. Um, who can you really rely on? And now they're starting to think about what are the components of friendship that I should be looking for and that I should try to be for other people. And this then, as they get older, extends into romance. What are the components of uh, a romantic partner and so on? Yeah, because I know every parent, every good parent, there are the few out there, of course, like anything, but every good parent wants their kid to grow up and have a good marriage and be happy. Sure. But, and what does it mean to be happy? Yeah. Is it really being pep rally happy, smiling all the time? No. Mm -hmm. And so now we're back to Aristotle and eudaimonia and flourishing. Right, yeah. but it's going to involve struggle and overcoming struggle, and that's satisfying. Yeah, and then um, one thing parents can do is like this comes up in voice lessons for parents too, is without going overboard or crossing a certain line, share things from your childhood with your kid, so they can identify with it. And maybe they won't open up right away, but because you know, I know I was a kid, so I know what it's like. Don't bother me. How was today? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But still, if you talk about without saying too much 
or crossing the line, certain things they sh kids shouldn't know, and it's none of their business. You keep things privately, just, just like you keep it private from other people, other adults, but you can talk about, yeah, man, like if you're all standing there in the kitchen, yeah, you know, when I was in high school, there's this guy, John, he was a total jerk. Even if you just say that, and then the kid might be curious, like, so why was he a jerk, or what did he do? And then you can start discussing what you did and how you dealt with it and why the kid was a jerk or say, yeah, you know, when I was in school, man, there's this teacher I just hated with a passion. But now I like her and just stop there. And the kid will be like, huh? You're weird. Yeah. You, you and, like her now, and, but you hated her then? Why are you so weird? Because she taught me. She's the only one that was demanding. And now I have value of it in my career. Whereas some others just let us screw around in class and I learned nothing out of it. And now we're into that, that abstract thing of what makes a good teacher. Yeah. Uh, to me, a good teacher is it gets better the further away you get from them because you realize the demands they made and it might not have been pleasant at the time, mm -hmm. but they keep delivering. Whereas the fun class that you had didn't deliver in the future. And then don't be intimidated. Like if, be honest with your kid. It's like, start defining what a teacher is or happiness or whatever. And it's something, it's like a journey or investigation you're on too. So what? You don't know everything. It's like, education is something that's done to us. It's not like, oh, my education was bad, so you're calling me stupid, or I am stupid, or my education was good, so I'm smart. No, it's done to us. Like Abraham Lincoln, he what, um, are, is anyone going to say he was like stupid or not wise? Well, no, not if they're reasonable or logical. And what, he was like uh, elementary school education, same thing with Thomas Edison. One of his elementary school teachers called an imbecile, you know, called him an imbecile. So it's more a matter of what you do with things than necessarily the education that's done to you. And then another great conversation to have with kids is about your failures through life yeah. because they tend to look up at us as being successful and admire us, which is great, but they're unaware of how much we failed through life. And, and colleges are now starting to encourage this because cool. of the increasing fragility and mm -hmm. mental health issues that these students yeah. are showing up with. Yeah. And they're having professors list, here's things I failed at. Good. Yeah, that's a very important part of life, too. It's like life had no success. People have to know <laughs> what a human being is like and what is actually going to occur in life and how we deal with things. Because, like, there's research you probably know about, Scott, because I know you knew a lot of educational stuff. But when children do some easy or medium problems and they get them right all the time, they think they're smart they cannot deal with the unknown or with challenges and they, they just buckle. Whereas kids who are sometimes given hard problems and they can't figure them out and they fail and they struggle. Sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they don't. They're the ones that are more flexible and agile and wise and really able to be successful in other things in life in that subject in particular. There was a great study last year between Anglo parents and Asian parents and how Anglo parents have a tendency to tell their kids they're smart all the time. Hmm. Whereas the Asian parents were telling their kids that they did well on something because they worked really hard. Yeah. And so they gave them an impossible puzzle. I, it may have been a math uh, puzzle. And they wanted to measure task persistence. How long would these kids work on this very frustrating thing? Hmm. Like a, and, like a romantic relationship. Right. So kids who were told they were smart have a tendency to give up pretty quickly because if I'm so smart and I can't do this, something must be wrong with me. And they have a little mini existential crisis. Whereas they had one group of Japanese kids that were 45 minutes in on this problem that was <laughs> not solvable. They finally had to stop the kids. And the kids <laughs> said, no way, we almost had it. <laughs> wow. Now, which kid would you rather have as an employee? Truth. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Or which would you rather have as a child? 
Sure. Oh, friend, you're in trouble down here. There's like Hurricane Harvey hits and you need some help. <laughs> who do you want to help? And and even away from the academics, who is more resilient, uh, resilient and robust That's to word. handle the challenges of life? Yeah. Yeah. So cool. So hopefully that was some good information for people. Any other last words you want to say? Uh, I think we should do another one. We have a lot more hey, to explore. Sure, yeah, it was great. great. But um, so hopefully people will, you know, remember some of the stuff we said was important. And it's like, like I like to say, not everything should be fun. Some things you have to go through the tedious work to really get important things out of a uh, learning situation to apply them in life. Um, so people like, listen to this a few times, think about it, really dig into it. We'll put some resources in the show notes for you. So you can like dig into some things yourself. Um, definition, understanding, induction, the nature of science, the importance of history. History is a laboratory for ideas. We should think about it not just as a bunch of dates and battles, but more fundamentally, it's a lab, like it's kind of a laboratory we have for seeing what kind of ideas work and what effect they have and looking for looking at cause effect relationships for ideas people are living trying to live on and act on and studying human nature yeah <laughs> very important but good so i think that's really uh mindful this episode for a lot of people so we'll stop at that and then do more in the future so people can really digest this um, as we say, it's important for teachers, students, parents, anybody who works, any alive human being who thinks can get fundamental, powerful ideas out of this that will help them think better and act better. So good. Thanks, Scott. I enjoyed it. Likewise. Much appreciated. So um, Hope, folks, you liked it, and uh, hope you look forward to more. We'll be having more conversations with Scott because he's got a lot of good information for us. So uh, thanks for listening, and uh, talk to you all soon.